It's June, and in India, everyone is waiting for the monsoon rain. Rain that will come not as a freak, but as proof of the climate's reliable rhythm. Since March, the sun has moved north of the equator, and now it is scorching India. With temperatures reaching 120 degrees, dozens have died from heat stroke. At Victoria Terminus, Bombay's main railway station, the rush hour is about to begin. Two and a half million rail commuters crowd into the city centre at the beginning of another sweltering day. The packed trains are stiflingly hot. Temperatures outside are in the high 90s. In these conditions, even busy commuters will stop to queue just for a drink of water. Now it's uh, scorching heat. It's very hot. Mosam bahut bekar hai. Garmi kitni pad rahi hai. There is an anxiety in their heart, in their eyes. They are looking towards the sky, and this is a common topic everywhere. Wherever you are talking to each other, oh, today it is very hot. Oh, the other man always will say, oh, the rains are going to come fast. It is the sun's heat that will bring the rains. But this year they are late, and people are beginning to wonder if they will fail. Along Chaupati Beach, anxious faces scan the sea for signs of rain. The entire city is waiting for news that the monsoon has broken over Kerala, the southern tip of India. Only then will it begin its steady progress northwards, bringing cooling rain to Bombay. One woman has particular reason for worrying whenever the rains are late. In the factory she runs, every window is thrown open to catch the slightest breeze. For the workers of Ibrahim Karim and Sons, this is the busiest time of year. As they have done for 120 years, skillful fingers are snipping and stitching, assembling and testing umbrellas. Ours is the oldest and leading uh, and the largest umbrella business. So we've been called Chhatriwalas to the nation. The umbrella, the umbrella walas to the nation. There have been times when the rains have not come till the third week of June. And that's when we have really worried, you know. Five million Bombayites await the monsoon with more mixed feelings. They will shelter from the rain in flimsy shanties like these. This street is Jula Maidan. No fans or air conditioning here. No running water either. Every precious bucket of water must be begged or bought and carried home. Every day the rains are delayed. Obtaining water becomes more difficult for the shanty dwellers of Jula Maidan. But the monsoon will bring enormous problems too. Outside number 39, Samina and her mother-in-law sell homemade food from a handcart. Just as the smoldering wood drives the flies from the food, so the monsoon will drive away their business. For the forecasters too, these are tense days. The northern limit of the rains is advancing, but how quickly? Three times a day, the telexes reveal the monsoon's progress. 
In the scorched weather office garden, an observer dutifully checks the rain gauge. But it requires information from around the world to forecast the monsoon. The heat of Bombay is just one link in a weather chain that stretches from Brazil to Tibet. The depth of snow in the Himalayas, the temperature of the Pacific Ocean can both affect its behavior. But for the Bombayites, the only question is, when? I think it's uh, within eight days. Within four days, the rain must come. Because you yourself must be feeling, it has never been so hot as it is now. The monsoon has been called the world's biggest sea breeze. The sun heats the air here so violently that it can rise more than 30,000 feet high. Wet winds sweep in off the sea to fill the gap and spill their moisture as rain. Bombay's fishermen see it first as high churning seas, dirtied by a wind blowing strongly from the southwest. It's time to get the boats in. There will be no more fishing until the sun, moving south again in September, takes the rains back with it towards the equator. Mrs. Karim, Chatriwala to the Indian nation, has seen the signs too. Fifteen days ahead of the monsoon, I can see the sea changing, the sky changing, and then the strong waves come and they dash against the sea wall. We have an office in Calicut, and um, our chap, our manager in Cal Calicut, always phones us. And he phoned us yesterday and said that the monsoons have broken in Kerala, so that would mean about eight, ten days. So we have this good signal. As dusk falls, people gather to cool off on Chapati Beach. The whole continent waiting and praying for rain. When, if it comes, the monsoon will be greeted with joy and celebrations. But the complex weather chain that brings precious rain to India can also bring misery. Rain which is every bit as predictable, but which is greeted with tears. The broad Mississippi Valley catches the rain from 41 states. When the river bursts its banks, there is nothing except homes in its way. This is what remains of Valmaya, the community rain destroyed. For the people of the Mississippi Valley, 1993 was the year of the $12 billion flood. 15 million acres disappeared under flood water. 50 people died and 40,000 homes were destroyed. Like the Indian monsoon, the flood's causes lay thousands of miles away, warmer than average water in the Pacific, an exploding volcano in the Philippines, exceptionally high pressure over Bermuda. To the weathermen, the flood was no freak. It was not even unexpected. But for the people of the valley, it was devastating. Time after time, generation after generation, the floods that follow torrential rain have driven people here from their homes. Despite millions spent on flood control, the waters have returned to these communities again and again, seven times in this century alone. For everyone in Valmire, 1993 was the year that something uniquely precious was destroyed. 
Half the families in the town were descended from the Myers, who settled here a century ago. People like Audrey Reaver, her daughters Linda and Bobby. To them, Valmire was so secure, so special, that they never wanted to move away. We had this tremendous extended family, if you can say that, for a village of 700. We hadn't had a flood here since 1947. So we had this sublime sense of security, living on, on the floodplain, living in this beautiful valley, not ever worrying about what the river was going to do. Record rain for 122 days. By mid-July, with a hundred rivers bursting their banks, there was a state of emergency in nine states. But even when Valmire was evacuated, people refused to believe it could happen to them. I felt the day we moved out of the house that we'd be back, that we were just uprooting all our belongings, you know, and we'd come back and just have to put everything back in place. Uh, I just would never um, admit to myself that it that something that devastating could happen. But during the night of August the 1st, the flood came, submerging farms and homes, coating everything with stinking mud, spreading chemicals across fields and gardens and into homes. It was two weeks before Bobby could go back home for the first time. I think I was in shock, I guess, walking through and, and, and seeing that there just was nothing left. And I thought, God, how did my ancestors come back in and deal with this, you know? This, this is where my family lived before the flood. And um, we're standing in what used to be my dining room. And it was yellow. <laughs> Because, I don't know, for some reason, um, that was kind of a favorite color of um, my grandmother and my dad. And I made this room yellow. The people here have lost everything that they associated with daily life. Their post office, their gas station, their grocery store, their church, their school. Most Valmire families, including Bobby and her mother Audrey, won't be coming back. Their homes stand derelict, abandoned. They have moved away to where the rain and the river can't get them. I uh, keep telling myself that uh, I won't fall in love with the next house I live in, and I don't think that I will, <laughs> but um, a lot of people feel, you know, that they don't want to fall in love with where they're at anymore, uh, because it can be taken away from you. You can't predict the force of nature. Up until 93, I thought, you know, everything was cut and dried and you could, could control everything. But that really made me realize that um, you don't have control over, over everything. In Bombay, the longed-for rains have arrived at last, a full 40 days after they were expected. Rain is a gift, not a curse. In July, this may be the wettest city in the world. In 1991, 35 inches of rain fell in Bombay in just two days. And in Charapunji in the mountains, a world record. 90 feet of rain in one monsoon season. The city is transformed. 
The parched grounds where the students were playing cricket is suddenly an emerald bog where a woman can cut grass for her cow. At the weather office, they've at last got something to measure in the rain gauge. Mumtaz Karim, Chhatrawala to the Indian nation, is finally doing good business. The monsoon played truant this year. We almost wondered whether the monsoons would come or not. And I think I felt like a farmer looking at the sky, wondering when it would thunder and when the clouds would gather and become dark. We always bless grandfather-in-law for having thought of making umbrellas. Uh, because there'll always be rain and there'll always be umbrellas. Other things may have changed, but the umbrella is pretty much the same. In the shanty homes on Jula Maidan, a patchwork of plastic and timber is keeping the rain out, for now. Life here will get much more difficult during the three months of rain and mud and floods. But in spite of this, Samina and her mother-in-law can't hide their relief that at last the cooling rains have come. <laughs> the monsoon is so much more than just rainy days in Bombay. Regular and predictable, it's the weather year's most dramatic piece of theatre. When fire and rain come together to give new life to half the world. But for Samina and all the people of Bombay, as for people everywhere, it's how the weather affects their daily lives that concerns them. We live our lives never thinking that our daily weather is just one small link in a vast interconnected system that circles the globe. Beautiful, destructive, without beginning or end. And set in motion day by day by the power of the sun. On savage skies next week, the terrifying power and hypnotic beauty of tornadoes and lightning. Granada Television has produced a booklet containing more information about the series. For a free copy, send two first-class stamps to Savage Skies, P.O. Box 32, Manchester M12 6GA. There is an anxiety in their heart, in their eyes. They are looking towards the sky. And this is the common topic everywhere, wherever you are talking to each other. Oh, today is very hot. Oh, the other man always will say, oh, the rains are going to come fast. It is the sun's heat that will bring the rains. But this year they are late. And people are beginning to wonder if they will fail. Since March, the sun has moved north of the equator, and now it is scorching India. With temperatures reaching 120 degrees, dozens have died from heat stroke. At Victoria Terminus, Bombay's main railway station, the rush hour is about to begin. Two and a half million rail commuters crowd into the city center at the beginning of another sweltering day. The packed trains are stiflingly hot. Temperatures outside are in the high 90s.
In these conditions, even busy commuters will stop to queue, just for a drink of water. Now it's uh, scorching heat. It's very hot. <laughs> Along Chaupati Beach, anxious faces scan the sea for signs of rain. The entire city is waiting for news that the monsoon has broken over Kerala, the southern tip of India. Only then will it begin its steady progress northwards, bringing cooling rain to Bombay. One woman has particular reason for worrying whenever the rains are late. In the factory she runs, every window... It's June, and in India, everyone is waiting for the monsoon rain. Rain that will come not as a freak, but as proof of the climate's reliable rhythm. <laughs> 